Well, hello everyone and welcome to this, uh, the, the final session of the, the ADA's first virtual copyright forum. Uh, my name is Ben Rice. I'm the executive officer of the Australian Digital Alliance. And I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm joining you today. Uh, on behalf of the, the entire ADA, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. A couple of notes before we get started. Um, uh, this session will be recorded for anyone who's not able to join us today. Uh, and we'll pop those, um, we'll make those recordings available um, after the, the forum is finished. Um, please feel free to use the, the comments box uh, and the um, uh, Q&A um, features there. There's also a little icon to raise hand um, down the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, we'll, um, we'll prompt you to turn your microphone on and ask questions of the, um, of the panel verbally. So uh, today we're talking about copyright reform, what's next, and um, originally this session was going to be a bit broader and looking at a whole range of copyright issues, but um, uh, as soon as I read um, uh, Rita's paper, which looked at um, AI impediments um, or copyright impediments to the development of AI in Australia, I thought it'd be really interesting to, to narrow the focus um, down to um, some of those some of those issues around AI, machine learning, and text and data mining. Um, so today, I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. Um, Rita Machulianit, who's a senior lecturer um, uh, of law at Macquarie. And we're also joined by Dr. Ali Akbari, who's the artificial intelligence and capability lead at KPMG. Charlton Hill, the CEO and co-founder, as well as Head of Music and Innovation at Uncanny Valley, and Caroline Pegram as well, who's the Strategy and Innovation Director at Uncanny Valley. So welcome uh, to all of our panelists. Rita, you are the author of a very impressive paper that came out recently looking at um, some of the um, copyright impediments to the development of AI in Australia. So, um, for everyone who is new to this sort of space and hasn't really looked at any of these issues in great detail before, I'd like to kick off with you, maybe to give us an overview of some of the um, some of those copyright issues. What are the impediments to the development of, of AI in Australia? So Hi, Ben. You. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting me and um, for your good, good words about my paper. I'm, I'm really happy that it kind of attracted your attention and you found it interesting and useful. Um, yeah, so uh, what are the impediments of copyright when we talk about artificial intelligence in industry? And I suppose well, actually there are a number of them and my paper discusses just one of them. So maybe I'll just quickly list all, a few of them and then I'm focus on, on the, the, the one that I discussed in my paper. And I think others will be covered by Ali and others. So I think, so the first impediment is well, in, as we probably have kind of, we, we have maybe some general knowledge about how AI is technology that's being developed. So we need, uh, we need a lot of data and, uh, um, and uh, to, to train the algorithms and that data is sometimes copyright protected. So sometimes we feed into algorithms such data as literary works like text or images, which could be protected as, you know, uh, by copyright or uh, sound recordings. And so the question then emerges, um, well, the AI developers, do they need to get a permission to use that data when, you know, to train the algorithm under, co under copyright law? And if we look at copyright law, uh, the problem is that, you know, it grants very extensive reproduction right, which uh, covers um, any digital reproductions, both um, uh, permanent and transient. Well, we have some exceptions but we'll discuss about them later. And essentially when, you know, all the copies that for instance, we make of this, this sort of data, which is called like, actually we may in corporate context, we probably have to use the, to uh, the term works. When we make copies of these works uh, for, for instance, to create a data set that will be used in machine learning program, we're already making a copy. And um, then, uh, then there are multiple more copies, transient copies made during the training process. So we have so the, we have this broad uh, that broad reproduction right, and at the same time we don't really have uh, any suitable copyright exceptions to kind of allow essentially AI companies to use that 
the, that content for training purposes without paying a license fee or, or without uh, asking for permission. So I looked in my paper and a, a few different exceptions, and we probably know that there are many different exceptions. And I kind of looked, tried to look in detail to which extent they could apply. So um, the first conclusion would be that as far as businesses are concerned, you know, they could not essentially rely on any of these exceptions, like research, like um, fair dealing for research purposes, you know, education purposes, or for news reporting, or any of these fair dealing exceptions. And uh, there are questions whether they could, to some extent, rely on so-called exception for transient and temporary uses. But actually, even if they could, this would not cover like permanent data sets, for instance, that are created you know, while um, developing this AI technology. So copyright exceptions don't apply. What that means for AI industry um, is that essentially when they use uh, uh, copyright protected works in the um, in machine learning process, for instance, um, they need to ask permission from right holders and, you know, and possibly pay licensing fee. And at the same time, while there are no, no licensing mechanisms that would enable them to get permissions from thousands and thousands often you know, of right holders that whose works they want to use because in, in many cases, for instance, works are being simply scraped from internet. They, it's very difficult to identify right holders. Also, even if you would try to want to approach some collecting societies to license such use, uh, for instance, as far as images, uh, photo, photographs online are concerned that are often used, uh, for instance, to develop face recognition technologies. Um, they, they, there, are, um, there are no societies essentially which would represent a, you know, a all or a big even part of right holders. So, um, so Australian, in Australia, industry actually faces that legal risk that they could be sued you know, by right holders when their works are being used for training purposes. You know, I can note quickly here that in other jurisdictions, there are um, copyright exceptions that would cover such uses. So US has a fair use exception that has been successfully applied in some um, text and data mining context, which actually covers also machine learning uh, context. And in Europe, they have introduced recently a new text and data mining exception, which is actually, you know, actually an interesting one. It's more specific, but also has some exceptions. So uh, in Japan, there is an exception. So Australia, while they're talking, like there's a lot of discussion about how we should encourage AI innovation in Australia, there is still a very limited uh, you know, discussion on, you know, how do we, um, how do we um, adjust um, copyright law? Um, there has been discussion with Australian Law Reform Commission, but recently actually government has not put this topic uh, under their agenda. Uh, in the coming year. So I think my pay, the purpose of my paper was to revitalize the discussion per, on policy level and say like, we have to you know, start talking seriously about that and see you know, how, do we, how do we want to adjust our copyright laws. And just last thing that I want to say is, is as I mentioned, it's just one of the problems uh, with copyright law and um, as far as AI is concerned. So another problem is for instance, uh, uh, I think Ali will want to talk about that more is um, so uh, copyright law, for instance, protects um, source code and object code that is software, but they don't protect algorithms. Uh, at least in some jurisdictions, very explicitly, explicitly stated that the algorithm itself uh, is kind of is it, it like it's not protected as a simple set of instructions. And Ali will probably will be able to tell us more how valuable actually algorithms are and how much more valuable than the source code itself. Another problem is. Um, uh, what about AI generated works or works generated by using AI as a tool, to which extent they are protected by copyright and there is a lot of discussion about this topic as well and do we need to introduce separate set of um, copyright rules on a ownership of AI generated works and there have been a few cases already in China, for instance, to, to address that problem. So yeah, there are a lot of issues in copyright law you know, that I think um, co uh, um, leads to increased list legal risks in AI industry. Thanks, Rita, for that overview of the paper. And for anyone who hasn't read it, I would certainly encourage them to do so. And we'll, we'll get a link for that and, and pop it into the chat. Um, obviously, the development of AI is, a you know, a, um, uh, an issue at the, the forefront of a lot of government minds. Um, around the world at the moment. Um, 
I noticed that um, next week there's a, an AI summit in New Zealand. Um, well, they'll be talking quite a lot about the development of, of AI policy there. Um, just yesterday, the Australian government announced more funding for AI research centres here. But copyright isn't necessarily something um, that often comes up as a topic in these sorts of policy discussions. So I think um, really interesting to have perspective like perspectives like yours um, in that um, conversation, Rita. I'd like to go to Ali now to talk to us um, about some of the um, industry perspectives um, around the development of, of AI in Australia and, and how copyright plays into that. Um, Ali, maybe you could give us a, a bit of an overview of um, some of the copyright considerations that, that you see from, um, from the industry side of things. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so first, I think it's good to say my background is technical. I, I am not that expert or, or even familiar enough in the area of law or copyright. But uh, I have been in, in the AI and machine learning industry for about 15, 16 years now. And I have been working in uh, quite a few different countries around the Asia Pacific. Um, so from, from that technical perspective and the technical lens, um, I, I think um, a lot of um, people in the area of data science and AI because they have background of IT and, and eventually in order to implement those ideas and solutions, they need to create software. So they have some familiarity to some extent with the software and digital copyright from that lens and that perspective. Uh, but but that, that familiarity is mostly about the code and, and software. When it comes to data, then because of that, that high level background, of course, there is a bit of uh, cautious and thoughts about, okay, what data am I going to download and use? But the thing is, um, as long as we kind of reach out to find the data and download it on our systems, and then you know, start training the models, et cetera, uh, because that is a kind of proactive and, and you know, active uh, activity, uh, there is, paying attention to, okay, where am I downloading this from? And if it is like a data set, is there any terms of use and so on? To that extent, it's okay. Um, however, in, in past five, 10 years, as we more and more move towards using technologies like deep learning, previously we, we were able to train the models using limited data sets or even, you know, uh, creating AI systems and machine learning algorithms, which are mostly based on rule base and, and the knowledge which is being kind of encoded inside the system. So in, in those cases, a limited amount of data was enough. But when we moved more and more towards the deep learning and, and that family of technologies and algorithms, then it, it is very data hungry methodology. It needs millions of data points in order to train your system. And that's where people have started to, you know, moving more towards, all right, now I need a huge amount of data. And that is in a lot of cases being automatically harvested, if I use the right term, from the internet. So I don't know, uh, some of the audience you may have heard, for example, ImageNet which is a collected database of images, like uh, I think about 14 million images collected from across the uh, internet. And, and um, it is being categorized and labeled manually into like 20,000 different classes. And that has been a, a huge improvement and it enabled a, a lot of improvements in the area of computer vision uh, using this sort of algorithms. But if you go and refer to their terms of use, it's clearly stated on their website that uh, ImageNet does not hold the copyright of these images. We have only collected and we have created those labels. So I am in doubt, and, and that's even a question for myself, how many of those people who are going and creating this, their models and training their models based on these kind of sources of data, do they really dip dig it? Uh, dig deeper into, okay, what is the complication behind it from the copyright perspective? Um, another interesting example is uh, um, if, if you have heard uh, the GPT-3, which, which became famous uh, around uh, 
few months ago, I mean, um, early this year, end of last year, um, lots of conversation about, so GPT-3 is an algorithm, uh, a model that was created by OpenAI. And basically it is capable of generating very human-like uh, text. Uh, it was trained based on 500 billion tokens of text data. And it is being collected from a few different sources, one of them being Common Crawl, which is uh, about 12 years of historical text data being harvested from whole of internet. So every month, their algorithm, their, their bot goes around the internet and, and collects this data and put it in some database. Uh, and it is available to, to everyone if they want to work on the natural language processing, if, if they want to train their model. And GPT-3, one of the sources to the training of GPT-3 was that database. Again, if you look into how, how that data is collected, there is no, of course, when it is automatically, uh, there is no confirmation of the copyright, et cetera. And again, on their website, it's written that, all right, if, if anybody notices that we are in infringement of copyright, please send us a note and, and let us know and we will take actions, et cetera. But all right, who, who is aware of this kind of crawlers are around the net and they, they are collecting their data. And even let's say, even if somebody complains and even if, even if you assume that data is being extra, excluded from that data set, what happens to all of those other models which were already trained based on that data uh, and, and being, being commercially used, for example. Anyway, so yeah, the, these concerns and questions are becoming more and more um, interesting. And I don't know, um, people are gradually getting more aware of that, but I assume there isn't clear answers yet. And, and this sort of discussions hopefully will help with that. So th that's one area about the uh, relation between the copyright law and the input to the AI and machine learning models. Um, the, the other area that can be interesting to, to think about and discuss is, is the copyright of, of those AI systems that are being built. So as, as uh, Richard briefly uh, mentioned about, um, the, the conventional IT solutions, the conventional software, there is a huge amount of coding and, and that, that huge amount of high quality coding is the real value of that software. However, in, in the AI in machine learning, um, the, the core system, the, the core part of the solution, which is that, that um, smart engine, are based on algorithms and, and trained models. It, it's, uh, it's about what, what models do you use? How do you train them? And, and what sort of parameters do you use? All of those things, which are not usually, they are not based on a lot of amount of code. It's mostly about a lot of experiment and testing and thinking. Um, so a software being automatically, because it's mostly based on code, it will be automatically, automatically um, covered by the copyright. But if we say copyright only covers those few lines of code of an AI engine, then basically it will be quite easy for somebody just to look at it, get the idea or, or get that, that algorithm uh, how it should be done, and then a few and another few line of code, and then it, it's basically regenerated the same thing. Um, I understand that. Um, well, if if it is like a great idea, a great algorithm, then it, the, the the patenting is another route to take. But it's a lot more complicated, and and is it really the best way to approach copywriting or giving that IP right to this sort of algorithms being created? under the AI and machine learning area. That's so the, the, the second area that I think really is interesting and, and good to um, investigate. The third one is being the outputs being generated by, by AI systems. So um, we have more and more AI solutions and then the algorithms which are actually, we can say creating things. So that example of GPT-3, basically it is creating some text, which is, well, in, in the ideal scenario, it, it can become more and more closer to the human generation of 
effects and, and being valuable to be actually used here and there. Or there are a lot of algorithms and, and AI systems that help, for example, to summarize lots of um, textual data and create a very simple and beneficial report. Um, we have, um, you know, we are moving more and more towards from using the word generation to creation for these sort of algorithms. So like the, the um, generative um, adversarial networks, people are starting to uh, name the newer versions as the creative adversarial networks, which is basically acknowledging um, these, these algorithms are actually creating things. It can be text, it can be uh, images, which is basically based on you know, a combination of lots of those styles, which the algorithm has trained uh, on, on them. And, and also, of course, music, which I think uh, the, our next guest, they, they will have a lot more to, to explain about it. And I think I, I wouldn't say much here, and I would be very interested to hear um, the, the, the next one. Thanks. Thanks, Ali, for that that perspective. Some of the points you've raised there are really interesting, and I want to come back to to some of those to talk about um, what the what the practical effect is um, uh, of not having these copyright um, exceptions on the on the AI industry and, and how that might be holding Australia back. Before we get to that, though, I would like to bring in um, Charlton and, and Caroline from uh, Uncanny Valley because we are lucky enough to be joined. Um, by these two people who actually use AI to generate um, uh, creative works and use AI and machine learning in um, in the creative arts. So I'm really keen to, to hear from them. Um, guys, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the work that you've done using AI to, to generate new works. Sure, thanks Ben and thanks everyone. Um, We've had a lot of fun over the last uh, years working in the space of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in the arts, in, in music. And um, I guess it's been a great journey of augmented creativity um, where we've been sort of uh, inserting new uh, technologies and processes into existing uh, workflows around um, both uh, song, songwriting from a melodic perspective as well as um, you know the lyrical perspective um, and production perspective as well. So um, for anyone who knows a little bit about music copyright, there there it's a you know a slight sort of black art of many versions of <laughs> of copyright from the composer to the lyricist to the recording itself and all the rights associated in reproduction. Um, so uh, I guess we'd love to talk about um, a, a case in point um, for those that, um, that missed it. We, we uh, as an Australian team of, of songwriters and music producers and academics, uh, won the um, AI Song Contest last year, which was the inaugural contest uh, based around the uh, avant-garde world of Eurovision which um, was a perfect uh, uh, sort of uh, landscape for uh, trialing our wares and, and um, uh, we were able to expose our processes as the other contenders were. So it was a great sort of meeting of the minds to, to look at um, where the, uh, the, the arts and AI is across the, the globe. Um, and look, we encountered some interesting, um, uh, you know, hurt, I won't call them hurdles, but interesting sort of, um, you know, uh, issues around implementing um, the processes into our traditional um, workflow. Um, and then it, it, of course, raised some many interesting things around um, copyright, which, you know, to this day, we haven't been challenged yeah. in any way. I think it was sort of a, a slight amnesty around the notion of using um, the, uh, the, the data sets. But um, maybe I'll throw to Caroline as to um, what happened during that contest in terms of the data set. And that might set it up for sort of uh, everyone to understand some of the things that naturally kind of came to the surface. Yeah, so when they first contacted us, we'd, we had actually created a um, AI Christmas Carol prior to that. So one might assume that, that a lot of that material is out of copyright. <laughs> um, and the, what they did was they gave all the teams competing an equal data set of 200, it was about approximately 200 Eurovision tracks, um, their MIDI files, so the musical um, computed notation um, of those tracks, uh, lyrics. We had had a an idea to do this previously. So we had already collected all the lyrics of all the Eurovision songs. I think they gave us the top three songs from every year since the beginning of the contest. Uh, so it was a level playing field for everybody, had a bunch of metadata with it. 
um, as to Charlton's point, we're still not entirely sure because we're not, you know, lawyers, whether that is a different law in the European Union and that whether, whether that's cleared. Um, so certainly we took all the, um, the data and we ran it through our processes. We included some of our own data. We've been working on a project with Google um, um, machine learning, using machine learning to create some tools for musicians. So we took some of the processes we've been working on with them um, to train the machines on Australian wildlife um, sounds of kookaburras and Tasmanian devils and uh, koalas, which is not, not the most exciting sound in the world. And out of that, we, we were able to uh, use that process to create what we referred to as a, a koala synthesizer um, and create <laughs> our track. <laughs> so we had a nice hook. But yeah, still to this day, I think we're, we're, we're a little unsure as to, um, you know, what permissions were sought originally around that data set. It, it was organised by broadcasters and there was contact with the Eurovision Song Contest. So we're hoping that's all legit. But um, yeah, it's interesting because you listen to that song and you, it, it's not recognisable as any other, particularly, you know, not that I know the entire catalogue of Eurovision, Charlton's more likely to. <laughs> But it's, you know, I guess that's where that, that those questions start to come in. Yeah, so just picking that up to, to kind of, um, uh, I guess, go through to what happened with the, with the release of the song and the, and the end of the song and then um, a standard process for us, us which is, of course, um, allocating uh, writers' shares or copyright in, in the final product. Um, we decided that, um, you know, we couldn't decipher between um, the traditional notion of songwriting, composition and lyrics in the way that we had um, curated some of the ideas that had been put to us by the AI. We, we broadly saw the AI processes as, as, a, as an ideas machine, as, a, as an influence on, on what we were doing, but then we were very honest about the human curation of those ideas. Um, so, uh, you know, the Australian Performing Rights Association asks that you submit a, a work for registration, and we um, applied um, uh, the data scientists uh, and um, the, the technologists involved as well as ourselves as songwriters um, uh, in a traditional sense uh, as the, um, the owners in the copyright, uh, you know, with the Performing Rights Association. So um, I guess what's interesting and in, in listening to, to Rita and, and reading her paper is that um, in our world, uh, it translates to, um, you know, not um, uh, changing the nature of copyright as it exists uh, in, in the music industry, uh, sticking to the plan of what copyright was originally set up to do in terms of sort of securing rights in a creative work with the, the, uh, the people who created it. Um, we understand that the laws, um, you know, since 1968, the Berne Convention suggests that uh, only humans can actually own the rights in, in, in written works of this nature in mu music and lyric sense. Um, and so that's not changing in a hurry. Um, and um, look, we're really interested in, in the notion of, I guess, large data sets being taken for creative output. But um, to my point earlier, I, I guess at the moment it, it resides in a place that feels like it's, um, it's sort of uh, it's taking the sentiments from big data. So in this case, it might be sort of suggestions based on large data sets of, of what might come next lyrically or melodically. And as long as the work uh, appears to the, the average ear, and that's something I say, um, you know, because in a court of law, if there ever is a copyright infringement, they'll bring in musicologists, which, you know, are, are, are well-studied individuals who will give a, their opinion on whether something is actually derivative or not. Um, and it still really comes down to, well, look, <clears throat> How much make, money is that the track actually making? So it can be challenged for its worth, and um, you know, uh, does the average person actually consider that it reminds them of, them of that song? And we all know of some famous copyright infringement cases that uh, have sort of really been fought out in the courts. And 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 did it, did anyone really hear it themselves or across the internet? Everyone will debate whether they they think it's been copied or not. But in this case, um, I guess our processes were were clearly exposed with the AI song contest. And so um, for me, I guess, to wrap up, it, it almost feels a little bit like the notion of, um, you know, when a tree falls in the forest, um, you know, it do, if it makes a sound, but when no one's there, did, it, did it actually fall? And uh, that notion applies. I mean, you know, you can use these systems to create new copyright that that's happening already. Uh, it's whether people can, can actually uh, determine whether that uh, has happened or not, or whether you've worked on a specific project where your process has been exposed. So. I guess we hope that's a, a good overview and we're really open to specific questions if this, um, you know, ex our experiences in the arts can be an analogue to what's going on for everyone else in their industries. 
Thanks, guys. That was awesome. And I really would encourage everyone to listen to the song Beautiful the World. Um, uh, I've had it on um, on repeat for the last couple of days because it's, <laughs> it's quite an awesome um, track um, and and picking out some of those, you know, those really like quintessential Australian sounds as well. Um, but I'm also definitely going to look up Koala Synthesizer um, <laughs> after this as well. Um, Caroline, one of the points that you mentioned, and I invite um, Ali and, and Rita to switch their um, cameras on as well, and for anyone to um, to jump in with with questions um, and, and comments. But Caroline, one of the things that you um, were speaking about then was that the idea of the um, the work being really transformative, and that you know it the the, the back catalogue of the last thirty years of Eurovision really isn't decipherable or, or recognisable in the in the track that. That you guys have have created, um, that to me seems like one of the you know the the, the key issues here. And, and maybe Ali can talk us through sort of on a technical process here. Um, but um, in the case of machine learning and, and taking big data sets, you're not actually um, uh, using direct copies of work and creating outputs that are really at all alike or, or similar to those those works are they uh not, not in the process that we used for the ai song contest definitely but things have actually moved on rather significantly since then within one year as ali actually referred to the gpt3 did i say that right i always said the wrong way right? no. the gpt3 model um which opened open jukebox the open ai model that has been trained on i think it's like one and a half million songs um, which, you know, is a process of predicting what's coming next. Uh, you, you can sort of, I guess we've, we've played around with it a fair bit. You can hear some elements of, of you know, the, the, the song that you may have trained it on. But generally, um, it's once again, it's still that process that Charlton referred to as, of curating for us and using it as an ideas machine. And it's not like we're pressing a button at this point in time and popping out a new song. Um, I mean, I think we've heard some examples of that where it has happened and it's, it's not particularly delightful to listen to. Um, but that, it is a huge question, like that, that data set sitting there on the internet for people to, you know, if, if, if they know how to use it, it's not the, an easy thing to do. And Ben, what's interesting is I guess um, everyone can agree that uh, music is actually quite a, a, quite a, a contained universe of, of information. Um, to your point about sort of, the, did it use any, any information that was sort of verbatim? Um, I mean, we did manual checks in the, 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 the text outputs looking for phrases that were, um, you know, a, a, a group of words that actually could be just, just simply search in a, in, a, in a document, you know, and say, well, are these appearing verbatim at all because we need to steer away from that. Um, uh, melodically speaking, you know, we used our judgment and it really was kind of a human manual process of sort of understanding the melodic content of the original tracks to the best of our abilities and understanding what was being output, but then also using a lot of human curation around that, which meant that, you know, I guess the, um, the, the odds of copying a song, go, you know, exponentially, uh, you know, or, or, or infringing, shall I say, becoming exponentially high because, you know, um, it's very unlikely, but Again, it's a contained universe. Uh, you know, you think of a piano and it's black and white keys. Uh, my daughter can walk up to the piano and infringe copyright just by playing a couple of notes because I can be like, ha ha, that's a song from 1976 that I know. And she didn't do it intentionally, but it's because there are no more keys on the keyboard and everyone's making these music these days. So we're catching up to ourselves in terms of the, uh, the, the creative output um, that can be trapped in copyright and, and melodies, most certainly. That's going to help us create the new music. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's an interesting area, you know, a, a close collaboration between uh, the, the lawyers and, and the computer scientists will help to answer some of these questions, hopefully, because um, a good understanding of how the algorithm is actually generating those outputs uh, might help to define, is it, is it actually infringement of, of the copyright of those input things or it's same as i listen to lots of music and then i say ah oh, well now i can create a new music which has probably inspired by some of those things that i've heard but yeah if if, if there is interest we, we can discuss further in the details of how many styles of those algorithms we have you you, you refer to the gpt3 which is basically trying to understand usually which note comes after this note or which word comes after this note there is another style which is basically trying to 
train two algorithms against each other. One is trying to copy and create something most similar to a data set that we have shown that algorithm. The other one is trying to identify, is, is this output a copy of those inputs or this is something just similar to them? This is just a fake one. And, and those two algorithms uh, compete with each other until that detector becomes very good in finding out, is it a copy, exact copy, or is it something in the same theme? And, and the other, the generator becomes more and more expert to generate something within the same theme, which is not really a copy. Sounds like a, a self-referential Turing test where the computer is trying to beat itself at being <laughs> a computer or, <laughs> or human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think from, from legal perspective, what I'm hearing, it's very interesting because we talk often about transformativeness, you know, transformative use. When we, we talk, when say, if we use a work in a transformative way, that's, that's actually a US concept that should be all right. And what I heard from, uh, from, from our mu musicians from Unca uh, Uncanny Valley, uh, I understood it's exactly what you're doing. You're trying to essentially transform the content and then you would think, well, that should be fine. And that's exactly the this transformative use concept is the core concept in the United States, which and which essentially allows use content, you know, without authorization, without payment, as long as long as it's transformative. Unfortunately, we don't really have this concept in, in Australia. So, you know, we have, you know, and um, we could discuss whether, you know, we would like to introduce it. And that has been a proposal set, you know, that in Australia we need fair use as a solution to this problem. But um, there has been also a lot of opposition, especially from in the uh, creative industry itself, because while well, it has some also problems in it. Yeah, but but I think the what the lawyers would say, actually, you know, from an infringement point of view, we don't really care so much, you know, what comes out of it. We look at where, where whether there was a reproduction of the work and that's it. So if you made a copy in your data set, you know, or from wherever you extracted, According to current copyright law, that's an infringement, and that's it. So, um, and that's, and I completely also probably agree with um, many many people who think that's that shouldn't be the case, and um, and we, you know, because you know, transformative use certainly have value. But just one last point that I want to raise, I think uh, the question is whether all you know machine learning outputs are really well, well, they're transformative, but actually. Um, Kind of in a different way. So, if maybe you've heard about new Rembrandt project, mm -hmm. so where like paintings were used to train machine learning system and then uh, of paintings by Rembrandt, and then they produced a new painting which looked very similar. Like I mean, which look was made like in a style of Rembrandt. And if you don't know his pictures, his paintings, you would think, oh, that's really you know, well, like looks like Rembrandt painting, but actually, um, but actually, it's not identical or similar to any other. You know, paintings. It's just his style. So then you, you know, it's transformative. But at the same time, you know, if we say, okay, we allow an exception in copyright law um, that you know, such as like text and data mine exception, where you can use works um, in machine learning program for free. What happens then? You know, when somebody wants to make take like works of one artist in uh, you know, feed them into algorithm and then start creating the works of a similar style, while not identical to the ones that, um, you know, um, that artists made before, but very similar style. And of course, they, they're likely to have, you know, commercial value because, you know, probably that's um, famous artist, just people love his, uh, his or her style. So I think this uh, transformative use is um, not always maybe a solution to the problem. It might be transformative, but still, somehow might sound unfair, you know, if we use um, uh, those previous works uh, to, to, you know, without paying the original right holders. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> problem out there. You raise yeah. a really great point, Rita. I was just going to say that um, taking away all the technology, I mean, you'd have to retrospectively sue Oasis for copying the Beatles. Uh, um, or, or equivalent sort of circumstances. I mean, you know, um, young bands coming up through the ranks now with all respects to their new works, you know, um, having a, a reasonable, um, you know, uh, understanding of the history of music, I would say, wow, that, that young band is clearly influenced by 
Led Zeppelin or, or whoever it may be, um, but because, and maybe this speaks to your point, Ali, is that uh, if the process by which they have generated the new materials is not in a code of codified form, it's just actually happening within the, the creative collaboration of the musicians, then it can't be scrutinized. So I guess one thing that we are both interested and afraid of is some idea of copyright um, checking using artificial intelligence, because um, if it's a nebulous process at the moment where a musicologist might be in a court of law, then to actually be able to quantify how, to what degree something's um, infringed musical copyright, um, you might not even get out of the, the studio before they say, listen, sorry, it infringes mm. copyright by 86%. The record label is not going to touch it. You know, you're on your own, buddy, you know, um, which would be a real shame for the arts. And that, that might speak to sort of the lawyers more than it does the artists. So it, there's sort of pros and cons as to that process. Yeah, there was an interesting discussion on some of this that came out of the federal court decision last week um, uh, between Clive Palmer and, and uh, Twisted Sister. Clive Palmer had used um, uh, had infringed on the the song "We're Not Going to Take It," um, and had essentially, um, for anyone who's who's heard the the Clive Palmer had um, used an incredibly similar version um, uh, after negotiations for to license that track had had broken down. Um, decided to try and rely on the fair dealing um, exceptions for that. But, but one of the interesting parts of that discussion, Charlton, to go to your point, um, was the idea that the original song, we're not going to take it, um, the first sort of six bars of that, um, or six notes, I can't remember exactly, um, had come from, had been um, uh, inspired by Oh Come All You Faithful. Uh, and, and the band didn't even realise that until 20 years later, um, uh, you know, when, when they were having a discussion about this this topic, you know, inspiration from from other tracks, um, and it suddenly hit them that oh yeah, you know, um, the singer I forget the singer's name, but had been in a um, in a choir when he was younger, and used, to sing that, <laughs> used to sing that song all the time. Christmas it's, will never be the same again. Yeah, no, it's a very. Right. I guess it is a, um, a nebulous process, and and um, I, I guess uh, maybe Rita can speak to this. But you know, the notion of um, uh, you know having an awareness of a copyright infringement versus versus not, and I guess. Um, the, I, I, I don't know the exact details, but uh, the Kookaburra sits um, men at work case, I think, was based on the fact that they had knowingly sort of uh, even in a live situation played um, Kookaburra sits uh, as a sort of a departure from the, the, the track land down under during their performances to sort of rest on the fact that they, they even exposed where they'd gotten it from. So I think that that might have played a role. I'm happy to be wrong on that. But, but yes, I think it's again going, going back to the notion of a, 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 a fairly enclosed universe. I think it'd be very sad to think that um, the law, you know, catches up with all of this to a degree that it stops um, creativity in, in the arts and it stops, um, you know, having influence. I mean, it was it Picasso who said something to the degree of, you know, real artists uh, steal or, you know, uh, um, you know <laughs> something I can't remember exact quote. But yes, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, but I'd, I'd hate to see it sort of impacting on, on, on the uh, outcomes of, you know, artistic expression, because that would be a real, you know, a real fail. <laughs> we should add as well that Twisted Sister now do a cover of Come All You Faithful um, uh, <laughs> that they play live as well, which is quite good. Is um, it public domain, so they're okay. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, we should get to some questions from the audience because I, I'm conscious that I've been hogging all of the, um, all of the questions so far. Um, but this is, is on a sort of relevant point um, that copywriters historically had to adapt to new um, tools of technology. And we no longer worry about the, photo the photographer as an author of copyright, um, you know, as distinct from the machine itself. Um, so then to what extent is, is the current work that is being created by AI and machine learning, not just another output from a tool for which the usual test of, of authorship should still apply? wonder if anyone wants to jump in and take that. Maybe Rita being the... Yeah, sure. Um, look, I think, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And in, in this discussion, there is, um, uh, we often hear that distinction between AI assisted works and the like autonom autonomously AI generated works. So uh, uh, essentially everyone agrees that, you know, when you use AI just as a tool, uh, there should be, you know, copyright of a work generated by AI and that copyright should be vested with a you know person who used that tool. But apparently a difference is there with you know when we talk about um, kind of very powerful AI systems which um, which are trained when you know the module is developed and then you know you give that module to a user 
and then they don't need to do that much except of you know triggering the system maybe putting a, a, a some inputs or instructions just like I want, um, I don't know, a, a text um, about, I don't know, can you summarize me news about COVID situation in Sydney today, you know, like, and, and write me a paragraph about it. Or, and then this, and then the question is, oh, is since the um, input from that human being is so little and the entire creative work is then done by the machine that the text is generating, the expression is chosen by machine, then that's where we have a dilemma. So should we actually give a copyright to still that person who did very little often, you know, except of using that machine, or, you know, we should say, you know, these sort of outputs by machine are not protected anymore, or should they be protected? And then who, maybe the, the software developer or like AI module developer should own it. So I think the difference between previous discussion and current discussion with relation to AI is that AI technology has become, or like is becoming so sophisticated that they, in some cases, they can generate outputs um, without much human contribution, or like at least at some level. Certainly, there is a lot of contribution, um, like from AI developer side, and so like software engineers, you know, architects, and so on. They develop all that software, um, but uh, the use of software might have, you know, not contribute that much. And at the same time, the problem is um, to, you know, we could say we could um, say that this this AI module developers would own copyright of you know, whatever AI um, generates. But the problem is that they don't have even an idea what they will generate, uh, what, a, what this AI system might generate. It's not that like as a photographer, you kind of um, set the scene, you know, you, you, you focus on the object and then click the button. The system might provide such a variety of different outputs depending on like what instruction is given that it, there is like a bit of a problem of saying that you know, everything uh, should belong then to, you know, AI developer, because they have not even envisioned, envisioned the, uh, um, the, the output. So that's, that's, that's a bit of a, you know, a, a problem, I think. Yeah, yeah, just, just to second that and maybe make, make it a bit more difficult for you, Rita. <laughs> um, I, I see um, the comparison of AI with, with a camera and photography is actually, um, it, it is an extrapolation and making making it a, a lot more complex when we are talking about AI, because um, if you assume uh, consider the, the similar case that we were discussing earlier, so there is an algorithm called GPT three that it, it is created by a company and it is used initially for generating text. So th there there is a lot of work gone into that. Anyway, that is a tool. Then a data scientist, uh, uh, another person who is interested will take that work, that tool, and then say, okay, now I want to use the same thing that was used for text. Now I want to use it to generate images, paintings. So they, they do lots of configurations, setups, tuning, and, and there is a lot of work going into that in order to use this tool to be converted from a text generator to a painting generator. And also during doing that, that work, in addition to add a lot of my thoughts and, and my, my efforts there, I use a huge amount of external data, which is copyrighted, lots of paintings from, from a painter in order to train, retrain this model. So there are more, more um, dimensions into this compared to the camera. And it's making it a bit more difficult to say, all right, which value is added by whom? and which part of that eventual final output is owned by which of these contributors. So at least I see three big players there. Mm. Charlton, Caroline, anything that you guys would like to add to that? I mean, I know that um, you, you mentioned earlier the idea of the, the different, what's the difference between using an algorithm to speed up the process of listening to 20 years worth of, um, of Eurovision, which I can't say I, I have done. Um, any thoughts that you'd like to, to add to that? Look, it's interesting. I mean, you know, since I guess uh, the use of instruments then went to the use of amplifiers, then went to the use of synthesizers, then used, went to the uses of, um, uh, you know, digital workstations like Pro Tools and some of these editing systems that are incredibly capable and, and um, you know, extensive plugins that are imitating 
um, you know, what would have been manual processes in the music industry from capture to manipulation to all sorts of things. I guess, why are we crossing a line into um, something that challenges this original notion of authorship? And, and I guess um, it's because of this notion of, of letting it run free or letting it run wild or setting it up and pointing it in a sort of a creative direction and then standing back as it kind of, it, uh, it outputs all this material. And I guess that challenges something that particularly from a, um, a creative perspective, when we've been working with artists, it's really interesting to see what they accept and don't accept uh, in terms of their creative process. And when we feel they feel like the augmented creativity is stepping on their human toes uh, in terms of what they perceive to be the, um, the, the very valuable contribution of, 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 of humans. Um, look, I think in a, in a really positive way, I mean, if things or processes and systems um, fall, fall to, um, you know, to, to the, the tasks of code or AI or machine learning um, because they're, um, you know, some, somehow the low-hanging fruit of, of kind of processes that can be sped up and it's very helpful to speed up. And in, a, in the example with Google, when we, we sped up some of the processes, some of the young artists were delighted because they said, oh, I, I don't really enjoy that part of the process. And it's really, it's sort of a barrier to my flow, you know, like then they, were, they, they, they loved this notion that they could just press a button and something would happen more quickly. But then they're incredibly protective of a certain area that they perceived as being the, the heart and soul of their of their craft. So I guess it's what we wanted to raise is that maybe it's it's very, it's, it's case by case. I mean, I guess the law looks for blankets in terms of how to deal with things, but, um, I guess it's 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 almost project to project in the way that we see that that the law has to be dealt with at, at this time. Yeah, 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 agree, yeah. yeah. And one of the things we're doing certainly in the you know the technologies that Uncanny Valley are, are building, proprietary technologies, is including um, you know trackability of everything that goes into those systems. So if you if you do have multiple authors, you'll know who they are. Uh, yes, to that to that end, I mean, if, if we're manipulating an existing sample of music that both has the copyright in its uh, its its creation, its writing, as well as the copyright in its its audio file, um, if we just sort of mash it into the machine and it disappears forever, never to be sort of discovered as to to its origins, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess that's very different to us keeping very close record of what happens to it and even setting up some sort of a a, a pro rata system where even if it gets mashed together with another. 17, 20, 1,000 things, then as, even if it's some sort of a, um, a, a micro payment or a micro copyright, I, I, we believe in that universe very much. And we're observing that as an evolving ecosystem. Um, and, you know, you can get into blockchains and, and, and uh, um, uh, artistic cryptocurrency discussions but without even going there. It's more about just um, the ability to track contribution has become significantly better. And that uh, should obviously play a, a way in which the law uh, you know, moves forward in, in being able to understand, well, listen, I can tell you who, who contributed, so why shouldn't they be acknowledged in some sort of way like traditional copyright and authorship, uh, you know, allows. Mm. And it's good to think of the way of setting these things up from the, from the start because then you are automatically addressing the loaded ethics questions around this stuff. Um, mm. So in the chat before, like, it's a whole other panel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think the, the 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 idea of AI ethics. I've I've seen the question in there as well. Is a is a separate panel, especially because we've only got six minutes left. And and I really do want to ask um, uh, Rita. Say we can assume that that AI, I'm sorry, that, that copyright is impeding the development of AI, um, both from the industry perspective and from the creative arts perspective. Because I think we you know we can all agree that there are some challenges there. Um, you know, even though it, as as Charlton and, and Caroline and, and Cali Valley demonstrate that it is possible, um, taking it as fact that there is a problem, what are some of the policy solutions? You've mentioned fair use, you've mentioned collective licensing. I'm wondering what you would think about a, um, a standalone exception for um, text and data mining or, um, or computational analysis. Yeah, look, yeah, I, so in my paper, I tried to look at some of the possible solutions and I should confess this, I'm still not convinced about which one is the best because, you know, all of them are, you know, provide solution, but not like maybe like most optimal one, but so what are they? So if we look into, you know, what exists already, so in the US we have that fair use, but I suppose, you know, in creative industries and everywhere we already, you know, we know how great and how bad it is. <laughs> so it, it kind of, it would allow essentially well, in many cases, free use of content for machine learning purposes, but it has a vast applicability in, you know, in different areas and creates a bit of legal uncertainty. And keep in mind that 
you know, Australia, we don't have many court cases in copyright field, you know, it's unclear how long it would take to clear the uncertainty about like to which extent, what sort of machine learning projects could be, you know, legal and which ones not under fair use. Now, another option, you know, what Europe did, and they followed their tradition of very narrow specific exceptions. So they introduced a text and data, text and data mining exception. Um, and they actually, well, so they said, you know, using content for text and data mining purposes, or well, essentially, which is essentially the same as machine learning purposes, is legal. You don't need an authorization or pay a payment, but um, they also uh, introduced an exception to that exception that right holders actually can opt out from this exception. So they can indicate, you know, if they don't want to give their con content essentially for free for others to use in machine learning context, they may somehow indicate that, you know, they, they, they opt out. So they can do it in maybe source code, they can do it on their website terms of use and so on. And then, so it's very interesting what will happen, but, you know, it's being criticized and, and, and um, welcomed uh, in, from, from different sides. And, we don't know like which creative industries might want it and how they might utilize it because you know like even if you say that you want a license like what does that mean for ai industries um you know like is there is a collective scheme there that enables such licenses or they should approach it was those 10,000 authors to get you know like um, their license if, uh, from them if there is no a single licensing body like for instance for images so um, it's it's an interesting, but I think uh, exception, but it, I think it addresses that problem, which actually I wanted to highlight that I think that was already pointed out that case looking by ca case by case is something that we would love to do, especially even looking industry by industry, because needs for let's say machine learning and interest in machine learning in let's say musical industry are very different if you think about medical industry or health sector that maybe want to also use records, patient records to machine learning process, uh, you know, like, and they are protected by copyright as well. <laughs> so, you know, you, and it might be like, um, you, you would think certainly we need an exception here, but in creative uh, sector, you know, we maybe don't want an exception. We actually might want to think um, that we want to remunerate authors when their works are used um, in, uh, in, in machine learning because in an AI industry, they say content is the fuel. So why would, you know, we let fuel for free? You know, why would give fuel for free? Why people who create that fuel are not, you know, not, not remunerated when that fuel is used in, in, in generating further outputs? So, um, yeah, so I think in Europe, they try to address that, that problem by that exception to the exception. <laughs> uh, not sure how it will work. I mean, so, and the third option, um, well, maybe, yeah, the third option, uh, um, we could think about is uh, so introducing some collecting licensing schemes. So the the um, I don't prob I, we probably don't have time to talk about like extended collecting licensing, compulsory collecting licensing. That you know uh, there are many different schemes, and I looked at them that could you know uh, and thought about them whether we could kind of make sure that actually um, people who generate that fuel could be paid when it's used in, in machine learning problem in, in context. But I I also again found very many difficulties to implement such system. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and the fourth final, uh, well, maybe coming back to exceptions, you know, you, or you, Australia has fair dealing exception, traditional fair dealing exceptions, which is something in the middle between fair use and the uh, and copyright exception, and that could be both flexible and they also have some presumptions and some, you know, like very clear set uh, rules and, you know, could accommodate some of the problems. But yeah, it's, 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 you know, it has to be really discussed in much detail. And I think first we have to decide whether we want to enable some sort of remuneration for such uses. And if we think, well, you know, since it's transformative, you know, should be exception, then we can talk about which exception, you know, suits Australia best, uh, fair, in fair use, fair dealing or a specific exception and how exactly we, we could devise, uh, devise that exception to make sure that, you know, we take into consideration all different industries that use AI based products and all different purposes, you know, think about transportation industry or media or health or, you know, t uh, education, they all have very different, you know, interests in mind and, and, and yeah, so it all has to be um, considered when when talking about like copyright law reform. Thanks, Rita. I, we're we're just on time there. So unless um, uh, 
the Uncanny Valley guys or, or Ali has anything to, to add um, as a final point. I think it's all been said very well. I think we, we look forward to, uh, you know, uh, navigating the landscape and, and uh, you know, sort of making sure that the arts is a, a significant part of the discussion because it, um, uh, it's not only important, it's actually a wonderful analog for other industries. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, same here. Great discussion, thank you. I just maybe, uh, you know, emphasize again, th there are lots of discussions happening around AI and I see um, all of them are being really multidisciplinary. Uh, we need a close collaboration between people from all of those areas, hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. have, have a better future and, and more uh, reliable and safe. Yeah, and um, certainly something that the ADI, ADA is is keen to, to work on going forward is bringing this, the academia, you know, industry and the creative arts together to, to keep having these discussions because I think it's going to be really important going forward, um, especially looking at international models and, and how they're working. Um, we had Trina Ha from the Singapore Intellectual Property Office speaking last week and Singapore is about to introduce a, um, a computational analysis exception. It'll be really interesting to look at um, and interesting just quickly to go to Rita's point, I, the, the Singapore exception um, has protections against contractual override as well. And they've just come down on the side that, um, you know, this is a, a public interest use that, that should be protected from, um, from that sort of, uh, ability to, to opt out of um, because of the, you know, the enormous benefits that it, that it can bring. Um, so with that, I would just say thank you so much to um, Charlton, Caroline, Ali and Rita for, for joining us um, and for everyone who, who asked questions. Sorry, Jess, I didn't get to your um, question, um, but everyone else who, who asked questions, thanks so much for joining us. This is the final session of the AEA forum as well. It's the first time we've run it virtually. Um, and it's been really great to, to have everyone involved. So thank you so much um, for, for being part of it and look forward to keeping these discussions going. Cheers, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.